want to share a message with you today on this Father's Day to reveal the heart of the Father a little bit. And by the way, the seven other campuses of Victory Christian Center said hey uh, to uh, sort of the epicenter where everything uh, began. In fact, uh, 42 years ago this coming Thursday, uh, we'll be here 42 years in the way that I'll be celebrating 42 years at Victory is I'll be in a dentist chair. So y'all remember that, you know, that's Novocaine, you know, is the way to celebrate, I guess. The very first time that I ever preached, I had given testimonies and I, I guess I had shared, it, which would not really be preaching, but at least a testimony uh, in the projects of Warren, Ohio on the back of a pickup truck. But it was a Sunday morning, it was 1973, we were at a place in, in, called Nelson's Ledges. It, it's a place where there's beautiful rock formations and people had, were there and we were there on a Sunday morning and we we're witnessing for Jesus. You say, well, why weren't you in church? Well, because our particular place of worship was called the Barn in Newton Falls, Ohio. We didn't have Sunday morning church which Sunday afternoon and Tuesday night. Well, while we were there witnessing, the leader of, that, of the barn, his name is Brother Tom Allman, and Brother Tom said, hey, I want you to go back and I want you to preach this afternoon. Wow, I'm 22 years old. I've known the Lord about two and a half years. I'm a veteran. I mean, I, you know, I, I but here's an opportunity to preach. I couldn't believe it. Ran back home our little house in Levittsburg, Ohio, got on my face and said, Lord, what do I preach? I've never preached. And what I'm going to share with you, uh, at least at the beginning of this message today, is what God laid upon my heart. Because see, Jesus came to reveal the Father. In fact, he even said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Here are the verses in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 5. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. And the very first words he says are very interesting. The Bible was not originally written in chapters and verses, but what we now have as chapters and verses, the beginning of chapter 14 says, let not your heart be troubled. Now that's an unusual way to begin any conversation. But see, in the previous chapter, just before this event, Jesus had washed the feet of his disciples to set an example he had then sat down with them and he shared that he was going to be dying. He had come to this earth not to set up a religion, but to give his life for your sins and mine. And as he had shared that with them, he also said, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. In fact, he said, by this shall all know that you're my disciples by the love you have for one another. So he says, let not your heart be troubled by the fact of what you just heard, but believe, if you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Well, then a relative of mine named Thomas, he's often called Doubting Thomas, he was not always a doubter, but he asked a question. I think they all had the question, but he was bold enough to ask it, and he said this, Lord, we do not know where you're going, and how can we know the way? Well, on that Sunday afternoon in Newton Falls, Ohio, that I got the opportunity to preach, you say, how many were there? Uh, 10 or 12, 100, no, no, 10 or 12 people. See, the barn was, a un was just an old dilapidated barn. It has now fallen down. There was no bathroom. There was not a porta, -porta potty. You, you better have, anyways, the, you sat on bells of hay or old lawn chairs people threw out. It's a place where Phil Keggy attended. It's, the music was phenomenal, but on that Sunday afternoon, there was 10 or 12 people. We were upstairs in the barn because sometimes we met downstairs, and what a privilege I had 
to say these words of Jesus. Jesus says in verse 6 of John 14, when Thomas said, we don't know the way, Jesus says, I am the way. Not a way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he says, no one comes to the Father. Say Father. But through me. As Christians, we often misquote Scripture. We will take like John chapter 3 that talks about being born again. And we'll say, you know, in John chapter 3, Jesus said, unless you're born again, you cannot go to heaven. Well, that's a true statement, but that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, unless you're born again, you cannot see or comprehend or perceive the kingdom, is what he said. In this verse, some people say, well, you know, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can go to heaven but through me. That's true, but that's not what he said. What he said is that I've come to reveal the Father, and I've come to give you a relationship with the Father. I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to the Father but through me. Jesus Christ said these words. Now listen. He then said in verse 7, If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father. And it's sufficient for us. In other words, that will satisfy us. That will make us happy. If you would just show us the Father. You keep talking about the Father. When one, one time the disciples said, teach us to pray. I think it's fascinating. They didn't say, teach us how to pray. They said, teach us to pray. And of course, we get from that what we call the Lord's Prayer. It's more properly, probably the disciples' prayer. But he taught in that prayer, what are the, do you remember the first words? Our Father, which art in heaven. And so Jesus, his whole ministry, he's, at one time they even said, called him good. And he said, why would you call me good? There is only one that is good, and that is my Father in heaven. So Jesus says, from now on you know him and have seen him. Then Philip asked this question, it would, it would just satisfy us so much if you would show us. Verse 9, Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long? And yet you have not known me, Philip. I believe that Jesus said that with a smile on his face. Some of you that are old enough, there's an old love song. I like, I'm a sentimental mush. We like old love songs. My wife and I grew up listening to the Carpenters and James Taylor and Bobby Vinton. And I know I'm dating myself. Well, come on. And look at me, I know I wasn't born 20 years ago. But there's an old song, that, and it reminds me of what Jesus is saying when he says, have you been with me this long and yet you don't know me? There's an old love song that says, if you don't know me by, you will. Yeah. Okay, there's not a lot of young voices saying this, you know. No, no. You know, if, you, if somebody would have told me that at my age you could turn on the radio and still hear the Righteous Brothers and James Taylor, etc., let alone that you have Apple Music or Pandora, I, I wouldn't have believed it. But he's saying, listen, if you don't know me by now. In verse, verse 10, Jesus is speaking. He said, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority. But the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me or else believe me for the sake of the work themselves. In other words, Jesus said, listen, the whole purpose of me being here is not to just show me, show you me. It's to show you him. And, and that's, isn't that the way we live? Uh, didn't, didn't Paul say in Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but what? Christ lives in me, and the life which I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul said, follow me, how? As I follow Christ. 
See, this aspect of Jesus revealing the Father uh, over in John 5, 19, which is a, there's one key pivotal verse. I, I guess there's many, but this is certainly one of the most important of how we do things at Victory Christian Center now for 42 years. People sometimes say, how, how did you think of that? Or how did you do that? Or whatever. I, I, I say, listen, and I teach leadership in a lot of places. And I tell people this. If you can learn to hear the voice of God and obey, you'll look a lot smarter than you really are. Why? Because God's smart. He's the Alpha, the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He's the author and the finisher. He's got this figured out. But our ability to not just do stuff and hope he'll bless it, but to actually get a sense of what he's doing. John 5, 19, Jesus is speaking and he says this, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, whatever my Father does, the Son also does in like manner. Here's Jesus saying, without the Father, nothing. I'm totally dependent. Did you ever wonder why there's all kinds of sick people around a pool and he heals one? Did you ever read your Bible and say, how how come that dude? How come not the other one? Somehow, Jesus lived so close to the Father that he could somehow spiritually sense and see and perceive that God wants to do this. My Father wants to do this. And he's simply asking me, to step in. How, how are there eight campuses of victory? Not because we, you know, I just, you know, somebody on the team had a great strategy. No, we simply gave our yes to him. And he seemed to just open doors and close other doors and do this and do that. No stress, no strife, no worry, no fear, no anxiety. Not hoping he'll bless it, but getting a sense he's saying this. Let's give him our yes. I want to close today with sharing a man from the Old Testament, a man you've heard of. His name was Elijah. You talk about a man of faith. You talk about a man of courage. I mean, he stood up against the king of the land, Ahab, told him, because of your wickedness and the wickedness of your wife Jezebel, it's not going to rain until I say so. That's pretty bold. And it didn't. You remember the story. Elijah then had to get fed by by ravens bringing him food and a a brook providing him water. And then God used a widow. But now in the 18th chapter of 1 Kings, there's been this showdown. Mount Carmel. And the man of God, Elijah, the man of faith, He challenged 450 prophets of Baal. One man of God, Elijah, against 450 prophets of Baal. That seems lopsided. Hmm. In the New Testament, James pointed out that this man, Elijah, was somebody just like us. He had same passions, same, he was human. And he said, the God who answers by fire, that will be the God. And he asked the people, the people of God, he said, if Baal be God, follow him. And if the Lord be God, follow him. And the people answered, not a word. And so this great challenge. And so he said, you go first. And so the 450 prophets prophets of Baal, there's this altar made of wood and the stones are around and, and they've got animals and and they're crying out to their god they're cutting themselves bloods everywhere they're jumping up and down elijah even taunted them so maybe you should be a little bit louder maybe he's on vacation maybe he went to the bathroom is what one version says they gave up Elijah had to have the altar rebuilt because of all the jumping and thrashing and everything. They rebuilt the altar. They had the, they had the wood and the stones. They had the animals. He said, pour some water on it. Because my God, a little bit of water ain't going to mess with him. Poured water on, poured more water on, more water on, water going everywhere. Praise a short prayer. 
boom, the fire of God falls from heaven, consumes the sacrifice. The be people begin suddenly say, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. 450 prophets of Baal were killed. What a day. It's a pretty good day for Elijah. What happened next? Well, he outran Ahab's chariot into town. The Bible says that. You know what? King doesn't have like a Ford Pinto chariot. He's got a good chariot. He's got a fast chariot. The old man Elijah outran Ahab's chariot. 20 some miles. Then Jezebel says, you think you're tough, don't you? By this time tomorrow, you're going to die. He runs for his life. He runs into the desert. And it's notable. He's just worn himself out with this supernatural run. Now he runs out into the desert, and the Bible says he is a servant, may have been Elisha. And he lets him there, and he goes out by himself and gets totally alone. The Bible says he finds a juniper tree and he puts his head down underneath the, of, and it's more really like a bush, and he puts his head down there and he says, it is enough. I can't take it anymore. I'm no better than my forefathers. Let me die. He's a death wish, basically. He's worn out spiritually, physically, mentally, emotionally, and he, he's there and he falls asleep. God sends an angel, an angel comes, wakes him up. When he wakes up, the angel has made him some food, and there's a container of water there. And the angel says, Elijah, rise and eat. Eat some food, drink some water, goes to sleep. The angel lets him sleep a while and then says, Elijah, wake up. Eat some more food, drink some more water, goes back to sleep. We, we catch up the story and we close with in this 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 9. Now, he, came to a, he comes to a cave. You ever been to a cave? Oh, I'm not talking about the ones that you spend the tourist money. We've been there. You take the little boat and the lights flash and you have a little tour guide. I like those caves. This is not that cave. This is a nasty cave. See, he goes into a cave. It says, there he came to a cave where he spent the night. I've, I've been in caves. Happy to be a certified scuba diver, and one of the things that you can do in diving is you could go cave diving. No, thank you. No, no. Uh, no uh, if you do that, good. Stupid is as stupid does, but it's okay. Uh, no, no, I don't want to do that. I, you know. Have you ever spent a night in a cave alone? It's cold, it's dark, it's damp, it's nasty. It's where bats hang, so there's bat dung. It's where animals go in, will leave behind remains. It's not a good place to be. You, you say, wait a minute, I, uh, you, you must have switched gears on me. A moment ago, you were talking about this man, Elijah, and the great victory and the wonderful thing. Now you're talking about somebody who is alone in the cave, somebody who has wanted to die. Yeah, same man. Same man. In leadership, we call it the Elijah syndrome. That sometimes after your greatest victories, mo most pastors resign after building programs. When it's done, read on. But the Lord said to Elijah, what are you doing here? You, whenever God asks a question, you better take special note because it's not because he doesn't know the answer. When God said to Adam, Adam, where are you? It wasn't that Adam, after his sin, found such a good hiding place, God lost track of him. Adam lost track of Adam. Elijah has forgotten his purpose. What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah replied, I've zealously 
serve the Lord your, the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you. They've torn down your altars. They've killed every one of your prophets, and I am the only one left. You, you know, we all face discouragement. If you think that you, you know, well, man, I'm a Christian and I shouldn't be discouraged. I'm a Christian and I feel depressed. I'm a Christian and I feel alone. I'm a Christian. And listen, Elijah is Elijah. Have you ever prophesied and didn't rain three and a half years? Please don't, but don't. That's power. Did you ever say a short prayer and fire falls from heaven and consumes? That's power. You can be mightily used of God and still go through your nights in a cave. He feels alone. He's got this paranoia that I'm the only one left. Look what happens. Verse 11, God says, go out and stand before me on the mountain. And as Elijah stood there, The Lord passed by. And and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain once the Lord passed by. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose. That's power. But the Lord was not in the wind. And, And after the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And the Bible says, after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. Let's face it. As God's people, we want gigantic. We want big. We want loud. We want powerful. We want like, that's God's stuff. But he's in the whisper. He's in the still, small voice. Let me tell you something about a whisper. In our way of living, often a whisper is negative because it's somebody might be saying something they shouldn't say, so they don't want others to overhear, so they're whispering. But there's good whispers. I whispered things into my wife's ear that I don't want you to hear. And if you've got a good marriage, you know what I'm talking about. But let me tell you something about a whisper. To listen to a whisper, you've got to lean in. You've got to lean in. See, we live in a day of noise. How many likes did you get? How, how many voices are saying this or saying that? I, I'm in a day where I don't watch the news just had it up to here. Noise, 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 noise. Competition. Listen. If you want to hear that still, small voice from God, and we need to, you got to lead in. got to lean in. And you got to shut down the noise. Outside, listen, and inside. Because there's not just voices and noise and volume out here. There's voices and volume in here. Can you stand your feet? As you stand right now, I'd like you to just place your hand on your heart. I'd like to pray for you. Father, in this still moment on Father's Day 2020, we confess to you that there are times where you have whispered and we have missed it. We also realize that you're not going to shout above the volume of those voices around us and those voices within us. We 
want and need desperately as Elijah did to hear our Father's voice on Father's Day. Would you whisper to us? Lord, for some, would you whisper and take away the pain that came from a biological father? Would you whisper the fact that we've been adopted into your family and we have a new father? And we've not been given a spirit of fear that causes us to run from you. But we've been given a spirit of adoption that causes us to run to you and cry, Abba, Abba, Daddy, Daddy. Lord, would you heal our hearts and our lives? And if we never surrendered our lives to you, may we do that today. Lord, may we be people who understand that, Lord, just like Elijah of old, we go through battles sometimes at the highest parts of the mountains we experience great victories and other times we feel alone in a cave but you are God you are the God who says I will never leave you and I will never forsake you help us to not live life by emotion but to stand upon your word even when it's a whisper would you open your eyes and as we close right now, just before Pastor Michael comes and gives you some ways of leaving the service under this interesting time of social distancing and pandemics and all of this, I want to look you in the eyes. And I just love to speak a Father's blessing over you. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the name which is above every name. For those of you in this room who have never received the blessing from your father because perhaps he did not even understand that and was not able to give it because you cannot give what you have not received may you today receive a sense of value worth and dignity that only comes from the whisper of the father May especially the men in this room, although I am not excluding the women, but especially the men, may you have a sense of the Father's blessing upon you. And today as we close, may you be strengthened, may you be encouraged, and may you feel so loved that there's not just enough for you, there's enough that overflows to everybody around you. We bless you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said... Give the Lord praise, would you, as Pastor Michael comes.